Welcome everyone to Becker's newest program on healthcare marketing, digital, patient experience, branding, and everything related to that. I'm Rhoda Weiss, National Healthcare Consultant, and also chair Becker's Spring and Fall C-Suite Conference and this new conference that you're all going to take advantage of virtually. So let me tell you a little bit about what we're gonna talk about today. Consumers want convenient, connected, compassionate, collaborative, less costly, and no hassle healthcare. They wanna be seen, heard, understood, and appreciated as individuals and expect their care, interests, and intentions to be known and expect to have all communication specific, seamless, and directed to their personal wants and needs. Health organizations want to gather insights to better understand consumer interests and intentions, deepen relationships to strengthen loyalty, inspire consumers with superior experiences and healthier lifestyles, as well as strengthen loyalty, personalize engagement, and elevate the brand. Today, executives from leading health systems will discuss reinventing the digital customer experience, what consumers really want, and how marketing can help deliver. Joining me today are Tanya Andriatis, Penn Medicine Vice President, Patient Engagement, and Chief Marketing Officer who leads marketing, branding, and customer experience, fostering growth, retention, and digital engagement. Home to our nation's first hospital in 1751, Penn has eight hospitals, hundreds of outpatient locations, education facilities at University of Pennsylvania and Perlman School of Medicine, and a long history in medical discoveries, including innovating CAR-T and mRNA. Tanya, who spearheaded digital patient engagement advances, recently led marketing at UCLA Health. Next, Paul Madsen is Chief Marketing and Communications Officer at Cleveland Clinic, a 6,500-bed academic medical center offering clinical care research and education. 72,500 caregivers serve patients at 21 hospitals and 220 outpatient facilities in Ohio, Florida, Las Vegas, Toronto, Abu Dhabi, and London, including its 173-acre main campus in Cleveland. Previous Delta Airlines Chief Marketing Officer, Paul now leads marketing communications, including brand, digital strategy, media, caregiver communications, and patient acquisition. Susan Milford is Senior Vice President, Marketing Communications for OSF Healthcare, Catholic system serving Illinois and Michigan with 24,000 mission partners, that's what they call their employees, 150 locations, 15 hospitals, two nursing colleges, and 1,500 provider network. OSF on-call digital health delivers seamless navigation and telehealth for patients. OSF Innovation, ranked among the nation's top 10, is a multidisciplinary program focuses on largest healthcare industry challenges. Susan previously held leadership positions at Santerra Health System and Barnes Jewish Hospital. What are you doing in the digital space to better understand what consumers really want and expect from their healthcare experience? And how are you uncovering valuable insights and ensure you're delivering the highest value? Tanya, you're first. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, and thank you for that first question. I think the key to the question that you just asked is how do you really deliver what people want and the value people want? And I think you can only know that by doing a really good job of understanding and having a pulse on the voice of the customer. So I guess I would answer that question by saying, you can start to deliver value and deliver what people want if you're tapped into where they're giving you feedback. That could be in the call center, that could be through forms online, that could be through patient experience data. And you're constantly getting a pulse on your market of what people are searching, what they're looking for, and, and how you can meet that need. Thank you, Tanya. And Paul, you want to build upon that as well? Sure. I uh, would agree with Tanya's comments and just build on it by saying we do quite a lot of primary research. So that would include, uh, for example, segmentation studies because not all patients are the same or have the same needs uh, in how they want to interact with the health system. We also do qualitative research. I think we believe it's important to hear the voice of the customer directly. And uh, often they'll express things emotionally or in language that can really impact uh, how you develop solutions. And then finally, we do quite a lot of user testing. So once you build a tool or build a web page or a web experience, 
is it delivering what you think it's delivering? And the only way to really validate that is with user testing and then to continue to optimize over time. That's great. Susan Milford, your thoughts? Well, I totally agree with what my colleagues have shared. The only piece I would add is, uh, as we've all said, it's really the consumer at the forefront and really looking at now we can really look at their journeys, look at their data online and their digital data, what they're searching for and make sure that we're using those insights to allow us to build on what they want and anticipate what they want, which really just builds trust in our brands, which is really critical to keeping and retaining those consumers. Next. We all know that digital content is critical to reach, leverage, and engage internal and external audiences to build the brand, to recruit, retain, and educate patients and staff in ways traditional media cannot. With so much information online, how do we really deploy marketing to build engaging, easily understood content that captures intention, inspires behaviors and actions, and keeps people coming back for more? Paul, I'm going to start with you. This is such a robust area. You know, the, your question touched on so many different dimensions of content. From a, a patient perspective, it starts with the concept that um, Google has over 1 billion searches a day of people looking for health information. And we have an opportunity as healthcare systems to provide trusted content, to provide content that is easily understandable and that helps them navigate to potential solutions. So that's an area that we're focusing a tremendous amount of effort right now, creating relevant uh, information about diseases and conditions. But we also create content about living healthy lifestyles, living well, and uh, that is very different content that people consume in different ways. We have a platform called Health Essentials. It's very fun and engaging and very topical. Uh, if you went down and think about what we do in podcasts, a very different environment, and we do a lot of educational uh, material there. We do um, patient stories there. Um, and you mentioned internal platforms. That's a very robust area to talk about, but we rely almost exclusively on digital platforms at the clinic uh, for and, and direct leader communication for our caregivers. A lot of video, a lot of storytelling, town halls and the like. So there's so much to unpack in this area, but you really have to understand your audiences and then understand the platforms and mediums and how best to use them. Thank you. Susan, what do you think? Well, I, there's probably nothing more important right now in marketing than content marketing. We've also focused a lot in this area. And, and one thing I believe um, that's happened is us all experience COVID has really made us um, more astute at how we can really help consumers in uh, the content world because you know when COVID came out no one knew what was going on information was changing every day and uh, our communities were relying on us for information on um, how to treat it what the symptoms were what they needed to do to isolate I mean you could just go through the whole whole gamut of that journey. And then, of course, when the vaccines came out. Um, so uh, I feel like COVID got us more um, astute at how to do content strategy. We um, used blogging as a really critical area in this space. And uh, again, as we said earlier, we all said earlier, it's really about what that consumer wants and providing that information and really anticipating it. Thanks, and Tanya? So I think one way to really assess in, in your market, what kind of content people are looking for is to look at Google search trends. Um, they differ by you know area and it's the best way to really prioritize, I think um, your content strategy in terms of topically, which areas you wanna focus on. And I think the other is to constantly analyze your data. What content are people consuming? Make sure that you're in a constant state of optimization so that you can switch gears if what you're putting out there isn't attracting the audience that you expect and that you can be in this phase of continual improvement based on user behavior. So next, how is marketing advancing the digital patient journey 
holistically? What tools, techniques, technologies, and communications are being deployed? And how do you measure success? Susan, we're gonna start with you. Great question. Again, I think your key word there really is the holistic journey. And in particular, um, I would recommend really identifying those key personas. Um, so, you know, for example, um, the consumer journey that we're currently doing for cancer patients, you know, you can look at, as we've, as we've talked about, you can look at what cancer patients are currently searching for, um, researching their diagnosis, their treatment, their survivorship. And then through mapping that cancer patient's journey, we can help operations to really provide that holistic support. So whether that support be the education and content that we've been talking about, but also particular services and um, care that they can get as well. So um, as far as tools go, I think this is really where personas and um, data assessment on those SEO journeys is really critical to setting up your holistic journey for your patients. Thank you. Tanya, your thoughts? Thank you, Rita. I, at Penn, we have been involved in this really transformational project we call Project Ascend. It's a project that goes across many different parts of the organization for operations to access to clinical care and marketing plays a big role as well. And really the idea is to address all stages of the journey from someone searching for a service all the way through what we call durable relationships. So keeping people attached and um, in a relationship with you. And so when I think about how to really transcend in this space and what we're doing with Project Ascend, we're pulling together three core systems. We're thinking about this from a platform perspective. We have our CCAS, which is essentially the telephone platform in the cloud, which routes calls intelligently, helps with things like chat, helps with intelligent routing, IVR, using AI and um, automating different kinds of communications based on different categories. Then we have our CRM, which is really that like patient 360 view, and it's our uh, way of engaging patients, putting patients in categories where we would keep data about personas, things like communication preferences. And then of course our EMR, which is our clinical system of record. And the way we're tackling this challenge of the sort of full journey of the patient is integrating those three core systems so that they can work together and create a communication kind of ecosystem where we're able to connect all the things behind the scenes and really provide this omni-channel experience. Thanks so much. And Paul? I, I think the patient journey um, where we can contribute as marketing in particular is bringing together content, tools, and technology. And much like the example Tanya gave at Penn, we're partnering on an enterprise project called Access Transformation, uh, working with our clinical teams, our IT teams, marketing teams to pull those elements together. So, you know, example would be when someone starts a, a Google search, how do we provide them that information on treatment that they're seeking uh, or about the disease and condition that someone may have been diagnosed with, but then help them find uh, an, or get an understanding of what the right care options are. And we're actually redesigning all of our traditional department pages to what we're calling care pages to help people make those decisions in a thoughtful way. And then connecting to people, uh, connecting people to tools like a find a ph physician tool uh, and adding new technology like geolocation to it so it can be highly personalized and relevant. And I do think it's that blend of content and tools and technology that can really lend ease and convenience and personalization to the experience. You know, we all talk a lot about the patient journey and the patient journey often starts with the digital front door. So how do we use digital tools to help navigate people throughout the journey? from timely delineation of potential health issues before they become serious to ongoing management of chronic health issues, connecting people with the right message and the right resources at the right time. And how does social determinants of health play a role in all of this? So Paul, I'm giving it back to you. You know, that's a, that's a complex question and there's many ways to come at it, but I think that part of um, addressing this issue is 
um, you have to make information easy to navigate. You have to make it easy and convenient for people to connect to the information they need for their lives. So that's, you know, making sure all of your taxonomy on your website, that all of your content is optimized for search so things are easily discoverable. And one of the things we constantly go back to the testing question, you know, we sometimes we put things in places that aren't intuitive to patients and we always have to be validating that we're helping people navigate in the appropriate way. Thank you, Susan. Well, um, I'm excited about this question because I wanna talk a little bit about our digital care entity, which is called OSF on Call Digital Health. And you know, certainly our marketing team is helping because as you said, Rhoda, it really is entering through the digital front door to get to that digital care. So we're currently launching remote patient monitoring for Medicaid patients, as well as our own employees through OSF on Call Connect. And this is the digital care um, arm of, of digital health. And the program offers um, those with chronic diseases such as diabetes or COPD, high blood pressure, those kinds of things, 24 seven support through a digital care team. Um, the, this is through uh, the Illinois Medicaid Innovation Collaborative also works in partnership with federally um, qualified health organizations as well. And I think what's really interesting about it is that we're combining community digital health workers to help um, the patients really be connected digitally to the remote patient monitoring but it also offers that virtual care, that ability to meet with that person. So we have really had to kind of combine all of these things. And you also mentioned social determinants of health. Those community health workers actually ask questions um, about those social determinants and we're able to connect and sort of partner with other organizations, not just our health system on how to meet some of those needs. So really excited about the advances in in this particular area. Tanya. I'm also really glad that you asked about social determinants of health because it's a, it's a huge issue that we have to address. And, and much like Susan, we also have community health workers. Um, we're thinking about ways to get technology in the hands of people who might not have otherwise have access. And also when we think about the way that we communicate with our patients, you know, reliance often on a patient portal or on them to have um, certain kinds of technology available to them to navigate a website or have a mobile phone. Smartphones are actually more prolific. 75% of people have smartphones. And so not relying on a computer-based portal and having the ability to communicate through text or through direct messaging or email that people can receive on a smartphone actually opens up how many people might be receptive to your messages, but it doesn't cover everybody. So I think there is a piece of this where you still have to think about, well, should we be looking outside of these technology platforms and tools and inviting people, our CEO talks about creating like digital health bars, inviting people to come in and use the technology on site or through community health workers who are already out there in the community and helping people get sort of technology ready. Omni-channel experience is a journey. What tools work and don't work in encompassing digital experience to ease consumer access, strengthen relationships and improve loyalty while personalizing engagement? Tanya. This is a this is a big one. Omnichannel is a, is a big one, and I think it's one of those words that sounds easy, but then actually in practice is pretty complicated. Um, in terms of omnichannel, I think of omnichannel as ways to create a similar experience in multiple environments, and then being able to sort of consolidate behind the scenes the data, the understanding so that you can provide more personalized experiences. We're working at Penn, again, through this Project Ascend project to really start breaking down the silos. We're such a big and innovative organization, so we have a lot of different pilots that are happening where we're using different kinds of communication tools, but none of those tools talk to each other. So we're in the process of 
consolidating some of those tools, but also connecting them behind the scenes, like I said, so that we have an awareness across platforms. Who are we talking to? When? How are they responding? You know, are we sending multiple messages from multiple platforms to the same patient? So Omnichannel, I think, starts with building like a system of things that talk to each other as opposed to a lot of systems that don't. And that's a big piece of that. But it's also using tools that allow you to create sort of a knowledge base of information that can then be disseminated across many different platforms in a similar consistent way. Thank you. Susan, your thoughts? You know, when I think about Omnichannel, I also think about that um, personalized communication and really knowing the customer to be able to respond to them the way that they want. We're working on uh, an advanced uh, digital experience platform right now, which will allow us to do an even better job at that personalized experience as well. So if then from a marketing standpoint, what we can provide to those individuals and kind of setting out again, kind of those journeys. So excited to continue to see this area grow for sure. Thanks, Paul. Well, we know when people are researching a healthcare issue or a disease or condition, they don't rely on a single source, even if it's a very trusted source. And that's where I think Omnichannel plays a critical role. It's really having the potential for surround sound on a particular topic. So it could be an article on a blog or the internet, um, but it could be a great video on YouTube, which is content that people interact with completely differently could be an interview with one of your physicians, could be graphics or uh, illustration or photography. So uh, providing a, a, an array of elements that help people understand an issue or a topic or a story is far more powerful than trying to get it all into a single source. And then our opportunity, whether it's using CRM or using search technology, uh, is, is to try to curate that for the individual. You know, one of the things we all talk about, we all, some do better than, but we, no one does perfectly is online appointment scheduling. So how do we continue to expand self-service tools and use technology like chatbots and live chat to reduce the burden on the contact center agents and reduce friction for patients? Paul. I mentioned earlier, we have a major access transformation project underway with our clinical organization, our IT organization, marketing and communications. A big piece of that has been leveraging online appointments uh, and we're seeing tremendous growth. Uh, I believe over 50% growth this year uh, with a large percentage of those coming through uh, our uh, MyChart uh, and particularly the Cleveland Clinic app, which provides access to my my chart appointment scheduling. And a lot of that is direct scheduling. Uh, so it's very efficient, very convenient for patients. And the more patients discover it, the more they use it. We do online appointment requests. And here we've been uh, doing a lot of user testing, creating um, optimized uh, user experience so people can tell us what kind of an appointment they're looking for, give us as much information as possible, and then our, working with our contact center, we still using digital platforms, we can connect them to an appointment. And we've seen tr tremendous increases in conversion by optimizing the experience in the technology. So just two examples, um, I'll let my colleagues touch on some of the other aspects of your question. Okay, Susan, you're next. This is a really critical aspect. And when I think about it, I think about what consumers want and they want the easy button, right? So they want that online scheduling to be easy and it's not easy on our operational side. I will uh, definitely admit that. Um, just to, to link to your other question, um, some of the things that we're doing in this area is we have a chat bot, I know a lot of people do, that does allow and connect to the scheduling component. Um, we're now connecting it to live chat, which we'll just be implementing in the next month or so. Um, and, but then again, like we've said before, it really is communication preferences. So uh, some individuals are still gonna wanna pick up that phone. But I think to your question, Rhoda, um, the, the digital experience is we do a better job with this through those digital transactions and through that online 
scheduling will build that trust and we will reduce the burden to the contact center, the, the live agents. Um, but I still think, uh, you know, at least uh, in our organization, we have a long way to go and we really have to all work together um, on the operations and the marketing side to make this happen. Thank you. Tanya? I couldn't agree more that it's it's a combination of the operations and marketing sides working together and that people want easy scheduling options and it's incredibly complex for us to provide those options. Um, and so often we're forced with that, you know, sort of battle of like, well, we're going to get the wrong patients in if we put a uh, the ability to schedule for specialty practice, but should we just clean up that mess in the background so that it's easy for our patients? And I think there's a lot to figure out there. In the meantime, I don't think we have a choice. We really do. I mean, people want this and there's some foundational things that we have to do to get there, including creating scheduling protocols that are standardized and that can be applied um, and having really good physician data so that we have data that's up to date. So when people go online to choose a provider, they're choosing the right provider for the right thing. You know, I think a lot of people also want to know in what ways are you using digital technology to acquire new patients and grow revenue? Tanya, you want to start with that? So I'll start with the human side of technology because I think that there's been so much advancement in this area. It's really exciting. I don't know if anybody's used um, Wobot, which is an app that essentially it's a, a it's an AI engine that builds a relationship with you, tries to understand what you're upset about, and then provides you with content to help you on your journey. It can escalate to you know a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but it's essentially it's a bot that's helping you with your woes, and it's extremely effective and it's sticky and it makes you want to participate in it. And I think um, those kinds of tools and like the advancements in technology help both from a business perspective and from the human perspective. And I think probably ultimately finding the intersection of both, which is what is our, what is the business need and where do we need to drive revenue? And what is the human need and where do we need to meet people where they are? And, you know, on the back end, we can reconcile, okay, so what kind of real transactions is this leading to? What kind of revenue were we bringing in from different tactics? Wow, that was great, Tanya. And I think it really, it goes back to that 360 view, right? And really knowing our consumers and then be able to serve it up that way in a personalized way. And I think that's what we're continuing to, to grow to from a vision perspective. As far as acquiring new patients and growing revenue, um, you know, kind of the cornerstone of marketers, right? So we, um, we're primarily doing that through a lot of digital marketing campaigns and the content strategy that we, we discussed earlier in our discussion. Um, you know, really looking at how we achieve lead generations, use nurture campaigns, and then really provide that sort of digital maybe landing page to support the consumer journey and then provide them with options so that they can choose the digital transaction that best meets their needs. Like Paul said earlier, whether it's finding a provider, getting more info, maybe doing a health risk appraisal, whatever it might be to kind of move them closer to meeting their needs and closer to the relationship with us. Paul, your thoughts. Thank you. Yes, we have very extensive patient acquisition programs in place that are digitally driven. They are paid search, which is a highly effective, highly efficient platform for connecting with patients because they're searching for a disease or condition. So they're demonstrating intent. And then we connect them to specific content. And then we can track them uh, through our systems from lead to conversion. And ultimately with our data science team and using our business intelligence platforms to contribution margin and return on investment. Um, we do the same with paid social. And we also use what is called response television, which to us is a digital platform. Uh, and in some markets, we combine all three. Um, and they've proven to be highly effective. I'd say on the human side, you know, of course at the Cleveland Clinic, um, we've done some tremendous work on patient experience and our focus on empathy. One initiative just to dimensionalize the human aspect is being led by our clinical organization. It's called Plan of Care Visits. I think you know this one, Rhoda. 
We have a goal for over 85% of our patients to have a plan of care visit every day in the hospital where their whole care team comes together, explains what's expected that day, and that has a dramatic impact on the experience for patients and their families. So um, that's outside the realm of marketing, but you know, it's just it's part of that entire journey and experience that that we know is valuable. You know, it's really not that much outside the realm of marketing. Many decades ago, I was one of the first two to have a marketing title in healthcare in the 70s. And people said, oh, marketing's, you know, whatever the business is. And I said, to me, marketing is the sum total of impressions, experiences, and relationships people have with your organization. And I think, you know, everything you're, that you're doing really comes back to this. Let's talk a little bit more about social. What works? What doesn't? How's it changed? You can give um, an example if you'd like. So, Tanya. Sure, I love this topic. Um, I think social is so many things, right? I mean, Paul was just talking about it as a lead generation tool. It's effective in targeting very specific audiences and often very effective in um, getting people to, you know, complete forms and and also become patients. So it's a very effective tool for business, but it's also a really effective brand platform and it's effective way to connect different communities that share something in common. What's worked really well for me, both at UCLA and Penn Medicine is the use of influencers and engaging community members. And when I say influencers, I don't necessarily mean celebrities or people, you know, of really high, like A level, public status. It could be micro influencers. It could be people who um, just have a following in a very specific area. It could be your own doctors and thought leaders, but leveraging all of those folks and their followings creates an amplification effect that you can never have just by pushing your own social content out. Paul? So I think it's critical to understand social media is not one thing. You know, there's so many platforms now, Facebook, very different than Twitter, than Instagram um, and Snap for that matter. So the platforms all can do different things. Some have the ability to be used as patient acquisition platforms. Most can be used as storytelling platforms to engage with patients and communities. Uh, we also use them quite effectively to connect with physicians. Physicians are highly engaged, for example, on Twitter, particularly at medical conferences. Uh, we've trained and many of our physicians responsibly use Twitter to communicate the work they're doing on research and education and innovation. That's great. Susan. Well, Paul, uh, Paul stole my first comment. Uh, social media, every channel is different and you, you really approach it similar to any other kind of advertising channels, right? You know, what, what what uh, audience does this one um, attract? Um, how is it used? And so all those things have to be considered when you're doing your integrated Marcom plan. But a couple new things I'll just touch on. Um, one is uh, the trend of social selling. And then the second piece that we're testing right now is uh, doing social stories and social reels on some of the platforms, which you can have a little fun with that too, a little, little humor, a little connection. Um, TikTok has been so successful with that at those videos, and now they're sort of migrating um, to some of the bigger channels like Facebook and Instagram, um, for example. So just a couple of new trends that are going on that we're seeing a lot of success with to connect people uh, to our content and other information. So um, how are you all keeping up with all the changes, the challenges, the overlap in functionality of digital and social while keeping teams abreast and skilled in all that ever evolving arena? Susan, you're first. <laughs> I know you love this topic. I do love this topic and I think it's just right on point because, you know, I, I don't want to date myself, but um, I've been in this healthcare marketing and communication game a long time. And when I started it, there was not social media, there was not digital marketing. And so we've all had to learn a lot of new things as our discipline has gotten more complex. And so it's really up to us to help upskill our teams 
and um, you know the uh, just for information, the top position right now in marketing being recruited is a digital marketing specialist. So it's really important that we um, ensure that our writers, for example, know how to optimize for SEO. Uh, just so many components. We're currently um, doing dual certification for 30 members of our team. And this is a pretty big certification that really goes deep into all the different components of digital marketing and, and social media, which there's so much, I won't list them all. And that's why I think it's such a critical area. Thank you, Paul. So for us, for me personally, to, to be able to stay out in front of digital trends requires looking outside of healthcare. Healthcare is not where digital innovation is typically happening first. So we try to engage um, with emerging tech companies, with the leading content providers, even with media companies uh, to explore you know, what's going to be on the leading edge, what's going to be the next trend. And sometimes you know, it gets us out in front. Social media, we were a very early adopter in that space and built a very a strong presence in social media. Voice. Um, you know, we, we made some early bets in voice. Voice has not really developed as a platform, but we learned a lot in the process. So th my advice would be, you know, lean in, look outside of healthcare, and don't be afraid to do some experimentation, even if there'll be some failure from time to time. Tanya, your thoughts? I agree with everything that's been said. I think I would add, you know, there is um, the ability to upskill your staff. At Penn, we've had a pretty large data team, for example, for, for many years. And I think it's about 10 people now. And it's a combination of sort of like data analysts all the way to data scientists and marketing. And they have been in, at Penn for a long time, as many people do, they come to our organizations and they stay. But they recently went through this process where they, the, the team participated in an upskilling activity. So they, they looked at themselves, they said, where do we really have some skill gaps on the team? And they co-created plans with their supervisors where they say, how are we gonna get the skills we need to be you know, competitive at, at the next level of this game? But I agree that there is like, sometimes like Paul said, this need to look outside again, to bring that spark in and to just get, get us to get out of our own way. And then every marketer should be a digital marketer. There shouldn't be this distinction of digital sits over here and other marketing sits over here. I mean, digital is marketing. And so I think like as table stakes, you have to know digital coming into a marketing organization period. So we, we can't leave this discussion without talking about telehealth. As we all know, telehealth visits skyrocketed during COVID, prompted exciting on-demand options, and, and listing just a few, 24-7 virtual urgent care with an e-visit where you just fill out a form and a couple minutes later, a provider gets back to you. A virtual in-home exam, I love this, I have tried this. You have your own stethoscope an otoscope, you know, and you put the routine visit in the palm of your hand. Um, specialty care e-consults, it really was fun. Specialty care e-consults <laughs> for the PCPs connect with specialists and they're finding that 88% of the specialist visits do not need to be done in person. So the question is, where do we go from here? Because it is so exciting. <laughs> so Paul. Clearly there was an explosion of uh, virtual care during the pandemic. It, it certainly come back to earth in terms of the overall numbers post pandemic as people re-engaged and came back in office. I think one of the challenges is figuring out for clinicians how they can best uh, have a hybrid practice of virtual and in person and how do they balance that from a scheduling perspective and based on patient preferences. Um, urgent care, as you said, the urgent care model works incredibly well. Um, we've seen some great success in um, specialty areas. For example, our Neurological Institute with virtual headache clinics um, have been highly successful as one example. So I do think there's lots of room for um, experimentation in different clinical areas to find out which types of patient, which types of experiences work uh, particularly well. Another area for us that's worked extremely well is second opinion. We have so many patients who 
uh, are seeking a second opinion or considering traveling for care, but they can get that second opinion uh, entirely through digital platforms, which is quite exciting. Susan, your thoughts on this? Because I know you've you you've done a lot in on the mental health side. What's so cool about the mental health side is that we are finding that the no shows for digital mental health have gone down dramatically because they don't have to go to a place where they may feel uncomfortable. So, Susan, your thoughts on this topic? Well, and this area is so wonderful for the underserved population too. It's really a way to um, better better serve them, especially on the wellness side. And, and that's certainly what we're seeing in um, the Medicaid Innovation Collaborative. Super excited about our hospital at home program that's getting ready to start. Um, and I think, again, this is going to help with um, with uh, decompressing the ED, hopefully decreasing wait time. So I think there's a lot more coming in this area. And I think as we learn more, um, we'll be able to use that data and information and then provide new services as we go forward. Tanya, and, and remember, we have to get reimbursed for it. So we've got to battle right. that as well. I think the reimbursement's a, a real challenge. And um, I just hope that the demand that patients keep expressing for virtual care will result in some policy change and um, result in reimbursement change. But Penn, very similar to Cleveland Clinic and very similar to what Susan said, we have Penn Medicine On Demand, which is our virtual urgent care, which has been a really successful program. I think there's a lot of work going on in sort of virtual first. So if we're having access challenges in some of our organizations, are there some steps and interventions we can take that would be virtual first? That would be another step in the process that could help us um, get patients answers earlier in the process. So this is an area that I think we're all going to be forced to continue to evolve because the demand is there and um, we're going to have to meet it. Here's the last question. While those who live by the crystal ball break a whole lot of glass, as among the nation's top experts, and I mean that when I say that, as among the nation's top experts in digital and social marketing, what can we expect in the future? 30 seconds each. Susan. Well, we've got to make the consumer experience more frictionless and more compassionate. That's what they want, and that's what they expect from other um, businesses, and so we need to do that. And I think those digital care options are going to help with that journey. So just the way we saw inpatient go to outpatient, we're going to see more inpatient, outpatient go to digital care as well. Thank you. Tanya. 30 seconds, okay, I think we're gonna have to be able to respond faster. I think um, voice search and, and the ability to um, adapt to, to the voice AI is gonna be a huge trend. I think there's gonna be more virtual healthcare. So like we've all said, things like online scheduling, virtual health is gonna to have to be easier, more seamless, and our operations are gonna to have to get in order to make that possible. And I also think there's emerging roles when it comes to things like health coaches and um, health navigators, and that those will become more in demand and people will expect a higher level of service in those areas. Thank you, Paul, last word. Well, with, with new players like um, Amazon coming into the healthcare space with One Medical, it, I think, puts into sharp relief how critical it is to be a leader uh, in the digital space. Uh, in my mind, it still starts, number one, with creating a trusted brand and trusted content. The people who create the most valuable, most engaging content in whatever format that may be, written or visual or video, that's going to be absolutely critical to being one of the leaders in this space. And then creating the simplest, easy to use tools that make care accessible and convenient. And we can leverage many of the technologies that are coming uh, from other organizations, things like embracing all the technology smartphones provide. So I think it's going to be very, very exciting in the years ahead. I just want to live another hundred years so I can see it happen. <laughs> There's so much wonderful things going on. Um, I can't thank the three of you enough. And I'm going to leave you with what my mother always taught me that relates to this. If you give up on your dreams, you'll wake up cranky. <laughs> thank you so much for your expertise. You are spectacular. 
Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you, Rhoda. Thank you, Thank you for including us.